afternoon, everybody. My name is Ron Ackerman. I direct the Institute for Public Health and Medicine, and I want to welcome you to today's IFAM webinar series. Uh, today, our special guest is uh, Dr. Renad Betis, uh, who's an associate professor of psychiatry, medical ethics, and health policy, as well as uh, medicine at uh, Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Betis is a nationally recognized expert in implementation science and is a founder and director of the Penn Implementation Science Center within the Leonard Davis Institute. Today, Dr. Betis will speak to us about harnessing implementation science to realize the promise of evidence-based practice in healthcare. As we uh, hear her presentation, I invite you to ask questions. Um, please use the Q&A function at the bottom or top of your Zoom screen to post questions. Don't use the chat function as we won't be monitoring that. Uh, as the questions come in, I will um, uh, ask them of uh, Dr. Betis at the end of the lecture. So uh, please uh, ask questions throughout and uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Renad Betis. Renad. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thank you, Dr. Ackerman, for saying my name correctly. I appreciate your attention to that. That was wonderful. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and start the slide deck. Can someone give me a thumbs up or audio that I'm good to go? You're good. Looks, looks good. Awesome, awesome. So thank you so much for having me today. I'm so excited to share some of our team's work um, on implementation science. Um, and it is an honor to be here. I won't get the chance to interact with each and every one of you because we're on Zoom. Um, and so I wanna encourage you to consider following me on Twitter and tweeting questions that you have um, that we don't get to in the Q&A. I will reserve at least 10 minutes at the end for Q&A, um, but I love when people tweet questions at me and I promise to respond to them. Uh, and I find the ImpSci hashtag a really nice way to stay up on the literature. So if this talk what's your appetite and your interest interested in implementation science, I encourage you to follow that hashtag as well. So uh, in the time that I'll be speaking today, I have three major chapters of the talk that I hope to give. I'll start just by giving a little bit of background on what implementation science is um, and why it's important, um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the applications in our work in one of our research portfolios, which is focused on mental health care. I want to share that what I talk about today is relevant across disease areas and settings, the methods that we'll be using, um, but we'll be focusing in on one of the specific areas in which we've done a lot of work. And then I'll talk a little bit about future directions. Um, my point of view or my vantage point um, is that of an implementation scientist. So that is going to pervade all of what you hear me talk about today. The goal of my work is to reduce the no-do gap with the ultimate goal of improving the quality of health and mental health services to improve lives equitably. So everything that I'll be presenting on today is kind of under that umbrella and value set. So let me tell you a little bit about implementation science and how I personally came to be interested in this topic. So I'm trained clinically. I'm actually a child clinical psychologist. And my path to implementation science emerged from a clinical observation that I just couldn't ignore. So I'm gonna share an exemplar case. I'm gonna call this person Jen. Um, Jen was a 16 year old female who came to the clinic that I worked in seeking services for pediatric anxiety. Um, and uh, Jen had a severe anxiety disorder. It was so bad that she wasn't going to school. Um, and she really had lost hope that she'd ever be able to do the things that she enjoyed doing. And one of the key parts of the story is that Jen had seen a number of clinicians in the community who had not used the gold standard evidence-based practice for pediatric anxiety, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and so when she came to me, she said, you know, I'm never going to get better. I've already tried therapy. I'm never going to be able to go back to school. You can see pictured here an illustration that she made towards the end of our work together after she had received the evidence-based practice for pediatric anxiety. You can see that she was able to return to school. 
do the things that she loved doing with her friends, performing in choir, and actually applying to and eventually matriculating to college. Um, and so this story kept playing out over and over again for me as I was training clinically, where I saw young people come to our research-based clinic after not receiving evidence-based practices in the community. So during that time, I came to the startling conclusion that kids were not receiving the evidence-based practice of choice in the community. And it really fundamentally changed the trajectory of my career. I actually went into graduate school thinking that I was gonna develop treatments. Um, and I completely pivoted and implementation science really seemed like a potential solution to my observation and was kind of gathering steam just at the time that um, I was making these observations. Of course, we all know that my observation as a clinician is not idiosyncratic to just my experience. It really reflects a broader field-wide issue. Just in the case of mental health, we see headlines like this um, all the time. And this was actually pre-COVID. Young people's mental health is a worsening crisis. Action is needed. This is representing the UK and US. We know that suicide rates in the United States have been increasing in young people over the past decade. And now with COVID-19, we see uh, increasing mental health difficulties in young people. And we anticipate that that will continue um, and not stop when the pandemic ends. So you might ask, okay, so there's this global mental health crisis. People are in distress. Do we have treatments to address young people's needs? And the resounding answer to that question is yes. If you go back five years, you know, there was a study done that showed that there were 700 randomized controlled trials, and we have hundreds of evidence-based practices. And yet when you look at community care, we know that that community usual care does not reflect the evidence-based practices that we hope that young people will receive, and that often the effect sizes that we see are attenuated, even when we do try to push our evidence-based practices out into the community. And again, just a plea for the fact that this is not just mental health. I actually do work in a lot of different spaces and I'd be happy to talk about that with you. Um, this is a favorite paper of mine that came out in uh, the late 2020. This was a top 20 health affairs paper, um, essentially making the argument that no matter how effective our COVID-19 vaccine would be, uh, that implementation would be the major barrier. So um, this was kind of pre, uh, presaging everything that has happened since then, when, where we see that we have this immensely effective vaccine and our barriers have been largely contextual and related to last mile challenges. So then, what is implementation science? So I like to share my cocktail party definition, or when I used to go to cocktail parties, people would ask me what I did. I would say, you know, my work is really focused on moving the needle in health and making sure that people get the things that we know work in the community. And I've added more recently equitably in that cocktail party definition. I think for me, equity was always implicit in the work that I do, especially because I do work in the public system here in Philadelphia. Um, but given the events of the past year, um, I think being explicit and front and center about the importance of health equity is critical in our definitions. I've also included a definition from the flagship journal Implementation Science, if you'd like a, a more scientific uh, definition. So implementation science is the scientific study of methods. We're really focused on methods to promote the systematic uptake of various things that we're interested in into routine practice. And of course, I just, as a reminder, this is not just an academic exercise. This is a highly applied science because our end goal is to improve population health. Our science has its own set of assumptions and foci that are fairly distinct from the biomedical research paradigm. So I find that it's helpful to share those at the beginning of any talk. Um, so that we're all on the same page with regard to what, what we mean when we talk about implementation science and methods from implementation science. The first distinct assumption is that implementation science is about clinician behavior change within organizational constraints. Often in biomedical research, we're very focused on patient outcomes. And while that's important to our work in implementation science, and increasingly we're looking at both clinician-focused focusing focus behavior and clinical outcomes of patients, 
really our target of our intervention or what we call implementation strategies is the clinician. And that clinician term is being used widely. It doesn't just mean a physician or a nurse or an allied health professional in a hospital setting. Um, that's why it's in quotations. The second key assumption is that we do not see context as a nuisance in implementation science. So for any of you all who are treatment developers or efficacy researchers who've done multi-site studies, testing your intervention, differences in your sites keep you up at night and you wanna control them out using statistical methods. We see them as noise. Um, that's not the case in implementation science. We characterize that context. We try to understand how it's related to implementation success. And we recognize that each site will have its own set of unique contextual factors, but there are generalizable contextual factors across settings as well. Third, we want there to be an evidence-based thing to be implemented. We don't wanna scale up and ask clini busy clinicians and organizations to take up things that we don't know whether or not they work. Um, so, you know, it's important that we have some evidence and each field has a different definition of what that means um, before we try to kind of take it to scale in these large implementation trials. And finally, we now as a field have a set of well-developed frameworks, methods, and outcomes in our toolkit, which you can borrow from irrespective of where you are on the translational continuum as a researcher. Um, and or as a policymaker or payer, these tools are helpful in thinking about both implementation research and implementation practice. And thus we ask specific types of questions that look a little bit different than what you might be used to seeing. So we ask questions such as, can clinicians implement evidence-based practices in their settings? What types of supports do clinicians need to implement evidence-based practices effectively? And that context word again, what contextual factors are associated with clinician practice? So I'm gonna wrap up this section on what implementation science is in just a moment, um, but I wanted to share with you, hopefully a helpful heuristic tool that my colleague, Dr. Megan Lane Fall and I developed as um, the course instructors of our Introduction to Implementation Science class at Penn. Often our, our students would ask us, is our question ready for implementation science? Um, and, um, and often it would be difficult for them to extract that um, verbally. And so we created this heuristic tool or this implementation science subway. So you can follow the stars here. The first set of questions you might ask yourself is, has the thing or the practice of interest shown efficacy. In other words, has it been tested in um, a tightly controlled, randomized controlled trial that's really uh, favoring internal validity to see if this thing works um, in changing the outcomes that you're interested in? If the answer to that is no, then you're doing more efficacy type research and you can include principles from implementation science. In fact, I think implementation scientists should be on every scientific team because you should be designing for implementation. You should have stakeholder engagement and end users involved in the development of anything that's eventually gonna be delivered in the real world by clinicians. But that's not implementation science, that red line. The next set of questions you might ask yourself is, has your thing or your practice of interest shown effectiveness? Now, if the answer to that is no, and what I mean by effectiveness are more pragmatic, externally valid, real world trials with few exclusion criteria and actual clinicians who practice in that environment. In the old days, you might've done something that we called an effectiveness study. And actually that in, on its own is not implementation science, although that's often um, a, a confusion point for folks. I'm just gonna look, it looks like there might be a comment. I wanna make sure I'm still hearable. Um, or maybe, Ron, am I good? I just want to make sure that I, my audio isn't cutting out or anything. You're good. Okay, awesome. I'm just going to ignore the comments then. Um, all right, so in the old days, you might do this effectiveness study really focused on patient outcomes, and that by itself is not implementation because you're not study, studying the outcomes, like how clinicians are delivering that particular intervention or barriers and facilitators to implementation. You're just focused on the patient outcomes. So that's actually not on, on the green line of implementation science. However, you'll see here on this, this middle star that we now have this design of study called hybrid effectiveness implementation trials that allow us to look at both patient outcomes 
and implementation outcomes. Um, and those are squarely within our wheelhouse. Uh, Dr. Jeff Curran has written papers about these trials, and I think they really are the future of our fields. And then on the bottom of the green line, you can see the bread and butter of implementation science. So these are studies on that bottom green line where we use mixed methods, mixed methods to understand the context in which we hope to implement. And then we design and test our implementation strategies, which are our interventions. So we're less interested in the thing that we're trying to implement and the things that we do to help clinicians use our evidence-based practice. Um, and I'm going to give you some examples of that in my, the application section of my talk. So that's kind of the background. And I'm going to jump in now and give you some real life examples so you can kind of sink your teeth into what these types of studies look like. So one of the key principles to keep in mind when you're doing implementation science work is that you have to have natural labs or ecosystems in which you do partnered work around implementation. Um, and so that's really foundational to everything that I'll be presenting here today. And I work in a number of natural labs, but the one that I'll focus on today is in the beautiful city of Philadelphia. And we have a population of 1.5 million. And you can see here the bridge that I walk over to get to work. Um, well, when I used to walk to work uh, uh, every day, um, and this is our skyline. We have tremendous assets in the city. One of the things that is the most, and I, I'm just trying to paint a little bit of a picture of the context of our city. One of the biggest assets is our prolific mural arts program. This was a mural that's only a couple of blocks away from my office um, in West Philadelphia at 40th and Chestnut. Um, and it's a beautiful example of a collaboration between the City of Philadelphia Mural Arts Program and the Department of Behavioral Health. Um, and so uh, we, these are all over our city and it's, it's a sight to behold. In addition to our assets, we also have a lot of challenges including the highest poverty rate of the nation's 10 largest cities and very high rates of violent crime, including a gun violence epidemic. We're also a city riddled with deep disparities. Babies that are born in Philadelphia zip codes only five miles apart face up to a 20 year difference in life expectancy. So if you're born here down by this star, this is called Society Hill, you'll live to be 88 years on average. If you're born by the other star up in North Philadelphia, your life expectancy is 68 years. So now that you have a bit more of a flavor of, of the city and what our assets and challenges are, I wanna tell you a little bit about how mental health care is organized because it'll be very germane to the set of studies that I'll be describing in this natural lab. So our behavioral health system in the city of Philadelphia is a $1.5 billion a year system. And it's operated by the city as a, and there's a single payer system for all public behavioral health services. So DBHIDS or Department of Behavioral Health oversees mental health, addictions and intellectual disability services and community behavioral health is a managed care company for mental health and addiction services and acts as a carve out. So it's a single payer. And over 150,000 unique consumers are served annually, 30,000 of which are children and families, which is the focus of what I'll be speaking about today. And this natural lab that I've had the great fortune to work in over the past decade is built upon a now 35 year, I've got to open, update this slide, 35 year partnership between uh, the Penn Center for Mental Health and the Department of Behavioral Health. Um, and one of the most amazing opportunities about working in this system is that Philadelphia commissioners of mental health have all had a vision that evidence-based practices should be available to everyone as a matter of social justice. Um, and these are the three commissioners pictured here since I've been in Philadelphia and each one of them has shared that vision and thus supported evidence-based practices for mental health in our system. And what's really interesting and exciting about the opportunity to do this kind of partnered work within a natural lab is that the city of Philadelphia has taken a very iterative approach to implementation over the past 14 years. 
So efforts to start implementing evidence-based practices actually predate my involvement starting in 2007. And there's a great paper that my colleague Byron Powell led um, that you can uh, check out if you'd like to read more of the history around evidence-based practice implementation in Philadelphia. But starting in 2007, Dr. Evans partnered with a number of leading treatment developers across the nation and started implementing cognitive behavioral informed interventions for a variety of um, psychiatric disorders. And I'm not gonna get into the details about the types of interventions because it's not germane to what I'm talking about today, but suffice it to say that they were all from the same family of evidence-based cognitive behavioral interventions. And he began to notice that these um, initiatives, we call them the evidence-based practice initiatives, were highly siloed and that they weren't learning from one another. And so after a few years of that work, training and supporting clinicians across the system, and there's over 200 organizations and thousands of clinicians, just to give you a sense of the scope, um, Dr. Evans convened the Evidence-Based Practice and Innovation Center. Um, and that was intended to offer a centralized infrastructure that would sit at the, the you know, community behavioral health, which is the managed care payer carve out organization that would really support across all of these different evidence-based practice initiatives that were ongoing and support new initiatives as they came on um, and had lots of different implementation strategies that were really system driven. I wasn't manipulating anything. I was just kind of a part of this natural experiment. So that happened in 2013. And then more recently in 2018, um, the city has deployed a designation process where organizations can now be designated as evidence-based practice organizations and they receive an enhanced rate for the delivery of that care. So you can see here that over time, this is a largely system-driven iterative approach to implementation. So I had the great fortune to design a prospective observational study that sat on top of, um, of this work that was going on and was driven by the system um, over the course of uh, about a decade now. Um, and so uh, there were, for the particular study that I'm gonna be reporting most of the findings from, we measured uh, uh, therapist use of evidence-based practices and some of those contextual factors that we're really interested in. Um, related to the clinicians themselves, like their knowledge and their attitudes, and then relating to the organizations that they worked within, such as the leadership of their organization or the culture and climate of that particular organization. So what we did was we had these three time points where we collected that information. It was all self-reported from clinicians and administrators. And one of our time points came before that centralized infrastructure EPIC that I described launched. And the latter two time points came after EPIC launched to see what happened to, to cognitive behavioral use over that five year period, given all the support that the system was putting into the centralized infrastructure. Just to give you a sense of our sampling scheme and um, the number of therapists and organizations that we enrolled, at that first time point, we reached out to about 30 organizations that serve children and families via outpatient mental health care. Um, and those 30 agencies, although there's actually 100 agencies that serve kids, 30 of them serve 80% of kids. So that was kind of the, the group that we were most interested in. We were able to recruit 19 of those 30-ish agencies with multiple sites and about 130 therapists. And then you can see over time that our recruitment increased. Um, we were more able to get more organizations given our increasing relationships within the network. So when all is said and done, we have data from about 500 clinicians and 30, um, 31 sites over the, the five years that we did this work. We also did qualitative work um, at the same time. So between 2013 and 2014, we collected about 70 interviews from various stakeholders within our system, including administrators, um, system leaders, and treatment developers. So the data that I'll be presenting kind of comes from this sample um, of time. So there's four sets of questions that I'm gonna share with you. Um, and I'm gonna keep everything really high level because I don't have a lot of time with you all and I wanna do an expansive survey of all the, the things that we've learned over the past decade. But I'm happy to answer specific questions um, as they come up in the Q&A. So the first question that um, I'll answer and share with you is what happens to use of an evidence-based practice over time with the launch of a centralized infrastructure like EPIC at the system level? 
what gets in the way of these types of practice transformation efforts? What helps or makes it easier to do these types of practice transformation efforts? And then more recent work, which we've done in the past two years and doesn't fall in that timeline that I just presented, how do we best elicit and amplify the clinician voice in how they want to be supported in delivering evidence-based practices, given that a lot of our earlier work was really focused on administrators and system leaders? So <clears throat> the first question, which was really the main outcome of the study um, that I'm presenting here, um, was published in Implementation Science in 2019. So check it out if you're interested in reading more of the details. And I'm going to boil down the findings basically into two graphs and a, a brief sentence summary. So what you can see here on this graph on the x-axis is time. So each of those three time points that I denoted where we measured therapist factors and their use of various evidence-based practices. And here on the y-axis, you can see therapists self-reported use of psychotherapy techniques with a representative client on their caseload. And so we basically said to the therapist, using a validated measure, tell us what techniques you used with a kid that looks like is generalizable or representative of your caseload. And what you see here, this pattern of results demonstrates that on average, clinicians' use of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the thing that we were hoping they'd use more of, which the evidence-based practice initiatives and EPIC support, increased by about 6% from 2013 to 2017. And these are highly complex mixed effect models that account for nesting of all the clinicians within organizations and nesting over time. But ultimately you see the small increase of use of CBT and importantly, another type of therapy strategy, psychodynamic strategies, which tend to be less indicated for young people, stays the same kind of as a validity check. Now, of course, these are self-reported findings. So it's just really important to keep in mind um, that um, you know, this isn't observed practice, but self-reported findings suggest that clinicians are reporting using more CBT over this five-year period. We were also really interested in answering a question related to these evidence-based practice initiatives or training initiatives that I described earlier on. Um, and so this graph kind of denotes the main finding from that, where again, on the x-axis, you can see time. On the y-axis, it's the same dependent variable, self-reported use of psychotherapy techniques. And you can see each of those lines represents a different um, situation for a clinician. Either they didn't have any initiatives, because there are many clinicians in our system who never got trained, one initiative or four initiatives. And basically, um, above and beyond that general 6% increase we saw in the system, for each additional evidence-based practice training initiative clinicians participated in, you see a 3% reported increase in CBT. So you might say to me, Renad, okay, how do you make sense of these findings? You spent five years measuring use of CBT. There was a lot of effort at the system level supporting, you know, evidence-based practices. What do you think? You know, this is certainly one take on these findings, you know, slow change in children's therapy. I personally am a half full uh, kind of person in terms of how I think about our work. Um, and I would actually argue that we saw a 6% increase in a system that serves over 30,000 children and families in a year. You might remember that I mentioned that earlier. And at a population level, perhaps a 6% increase in use of cognitive behavioral therapy could be meaningful. Now, we don't know in this particular study because A, we don't have the kids' outcomes, so we can't tell you that kids got better because of this. And we also don't have a comparison group. So it's possible that nationally all clinicians would report using more CBT over this five-year period. But it's a signal that something's changing in this large system that serves kids at a scale that is, is quite um, robust. Now, we have done some work looking at outcomes in our system through a separate study. Um, and this was work led by my colleague who's on faculty at UIC now, Dr. Brittany Rudd, where we benchmarked one of the initiatives where we're very involved in the evaluation, the outcomes of young people receiving a specific evidence-based practice, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy to the efficacy trials. And our work suggests that kids who get TFCBT in our system have 
you know, an improvement in their trauma specific symptoms and their general functioning, although the effect sizes are not as robust as they are in the efficacy trials. So that's a signal that we are implementing and that kids are getting better, although there's still some room to grow. And I think this is particularly important to note because um, a doctoral student in our group, uh, Ms. Brianna Last, has done some work looking at the sociodemographic characteristics of the young people who receive um, these evidence-based practices in our public system. And we find that our young people experience significant adversity. They live in the poorest neighborhoods in our city with the most violence. And so it's just important to keep in mind, you know, that, that these treatments are effective with these young, with our young people um, and that the, the needle is moving here. We do have an R01 that's um, in its no cost extension year that was focused on uh, fidelity measurement. It's called Project FACTS. And it's going to allow us to move past the self-reported issue um, that I raised uh, because it's all it's it, we collected actual behavior in session. So we've enrolled 126 therapists, and we have about 300 observations of in-session behavior. So we can start to look at some of these relationships with actual observed behavior, which I think will help us understand a bit more about some of the relationships we've seen in our work with self-reported use of cognitive behavioral therapy. So now I'd like to share a little bit about um, the, the, the matters that we've seen over the past decade that we think threaten practice transformation or implementation of evidence-based practices. The first is that we've really uncovered that the fiscal climate for publicly funded mental health agencies in Philadelphia is, is really not, not well, it's poor. Um, we heard things very under-resourced. We heard things from administrators in our sample, and this is a qualitative study. This was led by my colleague, Dr. Becca Stewart, who's on faculty at Penn in our group. We heard things like, we're losing our shirt. We hold our breath and hope when we pay people. They being the um, community behavioral health and the um, Department of Behavioral Health really do expect the agencies to sustain. How? We already don't have the funding to support our basic program, let alone anything extra. So a lot of signal and indication that the fiscal climate makes it very difficult to bring on new innovations or evidence-based practices. In addition to knowing that there was a, a, an under-resourced climate for the organizations themselves, we also heard a similar um, theme for the therapists who work in those organizations. So this was work that was led um, by a former clinical research coordinator who is now a doctoral student at University of Chicago, Danny Adams. Um, she was really interested in understanding therapist financial strain, which is basically their ability to feel like they can meet their monthly bills and live on the salary that they make as clinicians. And in this paper, she found that therapists who experienced financial strain were 1.3 times more likely to leave their agency prospectively within a year, suggesting that this is something that we need to attend to. And there's this really interesting finding uh, moderation effect in this paper. You can take a look at the x-axis. That's the financial strain. Um, the amount of financial strain is measured by a validated measure with higher numbers indicating higher financial strain. And on the y-axis, higher numbers indicating a higher probability of turnover. And what you can see is the therapists in blue that are not part of the evidence-based practice training initiatives, as financial strain goes up, so does their probability of turnover. And that's not true for people participating in the initiative. So there's almost a protective effect of um, participating in an evidence-based practice initiative. This past summer, we just fielded a survey um, of the clinicians in our system. And, um, you know, we asked some pretty nuanced questions about their economic situation. And to be completely honest with you, I'm highly distressed about the things that therapists reported to us. Um, almost 80% had outstanding educational loans, 40% of who had over $100,000 in educational debt, and about half the therapists reported going without medical care due to costs, with 30% going without mental health care due to costs. Um, so I think that there's some really important indicators here about how we support and um, finance our workforce that we need to think about if we really wanna transform mental health care. <laughs> 
Another major threat to implementation of evidence-based practice and frankly, high quality mental health care is turnover. So in social services, we see that annually about 30 to 60% of people leave their jobs. So this is a known problem. Um, and that was is true in our system. So we saw that prospectively of the clinicians that we enrolled in our study, about a quarter of clinicians and supervisors quit in one year. And I think that's important because often people will say that supervisors don't turn over, um, but they actually do. Um, and this suggests that once every four years, you have an entirely new workforce that you need to be thinking about replenishing. Um, and so any evidence-based practice or transformation effort has to be ongoing. It can't be static or a one-time thing. And then finally, and this is something that we completely did not expect when we started this study, um, we began to observe that organizations in the network started to move to a model where they employ their clinicians as independent contractors or 1099 clinicians, rather than employing them as employees or salaried clinicians with benefits. Um, and that's, this is actually happening nationally. It's a very concerning trend, and I don't think we've done enough work um, understanding the implications that it has on our workforce. Um, in this cross-sectional uh, study, we found that clinicians who were independent contractors had poor attitudes towards evidence-based practice, less knowledge, and reported using less evidence-based practice. And in qualitative work, it seems like administrators are much less likely to want to invest in contractor um, clinicians because they see them as more transient. Um, so it's kind of a catch-22. And many of the clinicians we've talked to and recently surveyed would like permanent jobs. One of the big problems with this model is that you only get paid for face-to-face -face client contact. So um, you don't get paid for paperwork, you don't get paid for supervision and training in most of these organizations. So some real concerns about this change and how it affects um, both just general mental health care, but also implementation of evidence-based practice. On the other hand, we also explored some of the factors that facilitate practice transformation efforts. One of the things, if you had to ask me where I would put my money if I had to choose something, is strong organizations. Um, and I, I wanna be upfront, I did not go into psychology thinking I was gonna study organizations, but uh, that is where I've ended up spending a lot of my time um, because of how uh, clear the indicator is that um, organizations matter in what practices clinicians use in the quality of care. So this was an early cross-sectional study out of the data set um, that was published in JAMA Pediatrics. And what we were interested in this study was we looked at our set of clinician factors. So some of the things like knowledge and attitudes. We also looked at the set of organizational factors. And remember, those were things like leadership and organizational culture, how things are done in an organization, climate, the impact on the well-being of employees. And we looked at each of those set of factors and the amount of variance predicted in use of evidence-based practice by each set of factor. And what we found was that the organizational factors predicted more of the variance in what clinicians reported doing than the individual factors when it related to use of cognitive behavioral therapy. So that was really an early signal that the organization itself is a very valuable lever for thinking about how to support evidence-based practice delivery. We use validated measures from the organizational literature. We use something called the organizational social context measure. And there's one construct within that measure that refers to proficient organizational culture. And that essentially means that when we surveyed the clinicians, they responded that their organization was expected them to be responsive to their client needs, to have up-to-date knowledge, and to be competent. And we saw that this proficiency organization culture was a really important predictor of a number of different things. In this graph, what you can see is that um, agencies that had more proficient organizational culture at the beginning of the study, like in 2013, they had more steep increases in use over, of CBT over the five years than organizations that did not. Um, so that's an important indicator that that kind of baseline organizational culture really dictated how successful the clinicians were in incorporating these evidence-based practices into their repertoire. You might say, Renat, that's a self-reported measure. Show me something that's a little bit harder of an outcome. 
So this is work led by my colleague, Dr. Nate Williams, looking at turnover, which is prospective and is a hard outcome. The person left the organization. Um, and what you can see on the x-axis is the T-score for proficiency culture in that um, organizational social context measure. It's normed um, on uh, over 100 organizations nationally. 50 is average, so anything above kind of 57-ish, 60 is considered good. Um, and what you see is that the, the likelihood of clinician turnover really dramatically decreases the, the higher the proficiency culture. So not only does it uh, predict more steep increases of use of CBT, it also predicts less turnover. So that, that suggests that this is an important potential lever for us as we think about supporting high quality care. We've been trying to move beyond, you know, putting a lot of variables into regression equations and looking at the relationship cross-sectionally and really trying to start understanding the mechanisms through which change in clinician behavior happens. And again, this is work led by my colleague, uh, Dr. Nate Williams, um, just published. And um, we found something really interesting, which was that we found a relationship between leaders implementation leadership, which is basically how much they support um, and uh, are perseverant in implementation processes and um, clinicians use of evidence-based practice. So we saw that the change in leaders implementation leadership between time points was related to change in clinicians use of evidence-based practice. And that was mediated by a change in implementation climate. An implementation climate is the sense that a particular evidence-based practice is expected, supported, or rewarded. So basically what happens is the leaders start to change their implementation leadership. That leads to a more supportive or conducive implementation climate, which then leads to clinicians' use of evidence-based practice. So we're starting to elucidate somewhat of a mechanistic understanding of how these constructs relate to one another, which I think is an advance for the field because often we look at frameworks that just have lists of variables and it's hard to know which ones are important. So the last set of questions um, that we've been asking have been related to amplifying the voice of clinicians. Um, so we have included clinicians in our survey work, um, but we think that it's really important to amplify their voice and to use participatory designs to make sure that any recommendations that we're making or things that we're studying really represent the voice of the clinicians who are the folks delivering the care on the front line and are the experts on what they need to be successful. So funded through a NIMH P50 Alacrity Center um, in collaboration with my colleague, Dr. Becca Stewart, um, we did this study where we used something called an innovation tournament um, to crowdsource ideas from clinicians about how their organizations can support them in using evidence-based practice. And an innovation tournament is basically like American Idol, but for ideas. Um, so clinicians in our network submitted all these ideas to a call for ideas on how they could be better supported. And then we um, had a gala and invited six clinicians who had the winning ideas. Um, and that was honestly one of the most meaningful days of my career um, because the clinicians were just so excited about being recognized and that their voice mattered. And these winning clinicians brought their family members, their partners, and the directors of their clinics. You could just tell that it's one of the first times that folks kind of recognize the expertise that they have on the ground and thinking about how a system might support um, implementation of evidence-based practice. We then took all those great ideas from the clinicians and we infused them with theory um, from behavioral science. Um, and we sent out a survey back into the system, same clinicians and more, um, using a method called best worst scaling. So for any of you do, who all who do implementation science related work, you know that we have some measures to get at stakeholder preference with regard to implementation strategies, but often we see a ceiling effect with these Likert type um, approaches. And so with best worst scaling, you essentially see 11 blocks that look like this, where you have to select what's most useful and what's least useful. And this is, this is a strong method because it really forces stakeholders to pick what they prefer most. Um, and um, what, we, what you can see here are all the different 
um, implementation strategies that our stakeholders rated using best worth scaling, and that the top two most preferred were getting either paid extra per session or getting preparation time compensated. Um, and that the worst preferred or the least preferred were things that had to do with either peer comparison or um, feedback on their performance, either public or private. Um, this is really interesting because if you go to other analog literatures, there's a lot of excitement about peer comparison when we think about clinicians, whether they be physicians, master's level mental health therapists or nurses. Um, and it seems like there's a new story emerging that although these may be really effective strategies, they're really not preferred. So there's some really interesting questions around whether you use the most preferred strategies or the least preferred and how that interfaces with uh, effectiveness. So where are we now? You know, we've largely been doing a lot of observational work to really get to know the system over the past um, decade. And, you know, because the system is enacting a lot of implementation strategies, um, you know, we've really measured that and tried to understand what's made those strategies successful. We are at a place now, I think, where we're ready to think about doing experimental studies of testing different implementation strategies to increase use of evidence-based practice, which there's still a lot of room to grow on. And we're using our work that I just presented um, and what we know about contextual factors or determinants, that's something, that's terminology we use in implementation science, stakeholder preference and theory um, in how best to design and test those strategies. So let me put it all together before I conclude. This work allowed us to take a magnifying glass to the infrastructure of outpatient behavioral health services in the city of Philadelphia. And it showed us that the infrastructure is under uh, immense uh, duress. This has really led um, our team to think about Maslow's hierarchy for community mental health. This paper was just published last week and it's probably um, one of the papers that I'm the most proud of. And it makes the argument that you know, organizations are really concerned about keeping the lights on, staying compliant with regulations and retaining their consumers. They all want to do evidence-based practice, but it's really difficult. It's like self-actualization. And given all the stressors that are present in these settings, very under-resourced settings, I'm worried about layering very complex um, psychosocial evidence-based practices on top of that. Um, and I think there's still some thinking for us to do. And basically this paper calls for more aggressively resourcing and funding mental health care, um, which uh, I believe is a big part of the solution. So, um, you know, across these set of studies, I hope the main points you've gleaned are that the learning that our system did was iterative and dynamic. So they didn't just pick an implementation approach and stay with it. They changed over time in a response to our partnership where we were doing evaluation and research and feeding that back into the system. So that partnership was critical. If I had to pick one thing, the organizational factors, especially proficiency, culture, implementation, leadership, and climate, those are key targets for us to think about in implementation of evidence-based practices, particularly in mental health, although I would argue these are probably important across um, uh, types of healthcare. Third, evidence-based practices are not going to be a panacea for infrastructural challenges. Um, I think sometimes we think that these interventions are going to solve all the problems that already exist, and I think that that is not going to be the case. Um, and then I guess if you only take one thing away from this talk, um, I think that we have to aggressively resource mental health care. And if not now, when our world is experiencing um, dramatic increases in psychiatric disorders, then when? The last point that I'd like to make is, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the past decade in community mental health settings, um, and I think that I've, I've made an error and an assumption that, you know, if clinicians just worked a little bit harder or were more motivated, they could do more evidence-based practice. Um, and as I've spent time in these settings, I've realized how problematic that assumption is. Um, I would argue that the clinicians are working incredibly hard and adding evidence-based practices really just makes their life more difficult. Um, and so this has really pushed our thinking um, and drawing on behavioral economics, thinking about what if instead of making it harder for clinicians, we focused on making it easier for them. 
And that really is the core of behavioral economics to kind of engineer the environment using choice architecture to make it easier for folks to make the right decision at the right time. Just to give you an example of that, one of our clinicians suggested the waiting room in, in these clinics is a really chaotic place that makes it hard for clients to come into the therapy session ready to work. Could we make the waiting room a more relaxing place where clients then are ready to enter the therapeutic encounter to do the work? Um, you know, I think there's lots of ways we can draw on these principles. We have this P50 that it's, is in its last year where we've been learning a lot about how to apply these concepts. And I think there's a lot of promise here. So to conclude, implementation science has the potential to improve lives. And I hope that I've convinced you of that in the time that we've had today. It allows us to move the needle, achieve the promise of scientific discovery, which we spend billions of dollars on and have impact. And that is what gets me up in the morning. How can our team have impact on the lives of individuals equitably? And although I focused all of this presentation on our mental health portfolio, these methods can be applied across disease, uh, diseases, evidence-based practices, and settings. Um, and I know there's lots of folks at Northwestern doing exciting work at, across these areas. This is just some of the areas in which we're also exploring implementation science methods. So we have uh, projects in HIV, in cancer, suicide, bronchiolitis, cardiovascular disease, and we're doing this work in lots of different settings. So the methods are germane across diseases um, and settings. So in closing, um, I just wanna thank you for your time. I also want to note that this talk is dedicated to three giants of community mental health who taught me so much of what I just shared with you. We've lost them this year. Um, and uh, I hope that this talk makes them proud and carries on their legacy. Um, and then all of the individuals, and this isn't even everyone, it's hard to fit everyone onto one slide, um, but who have contributed to this work, our team, our colleagues, our partners, and the clinicians and young people who have opened their organizations and their hearts to us and participated in our research. So thank you very much. I'm gonna stop share now and um, open it up to questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bates. That was uh, absolutely wonderful. Um, there are a few questions. Uh, we'll start with a simple one. Um, one is just, can you just uh, differentiate maybe the, um, what, what, dis what, what differentiates uh, quality improvement frameworks from implementation science frameworks and tools? Yeah, absolutely. I get that question all the time. Um, there's a really awesome paper that I can share with this group, uh, Kozawara and colleagues. Um, it's written in an ASCO journal and they have this table where they have like, here's quality improvement, here's implementation science, here's how they're similar, here's how they're different. So I often think of quality improvement as local efforts to make change. And there isn't a requirement that it's an evidence-based practice. They have a set of tools and frameworks that they draw from. Um, and they are, their etiology is different. They come from a different tradition. Um, same for implementation science. You know, we have a different tradition, uh, you know, uh, comes from Roger's diffusion of innovations rather than Deering and some of the engineering work for quality improvement. The long and short of it is that I think more and more they're not different. They are coming, they're under the same umbrella. And I think that QI folks borrow from implementation science, implementation science folks borrow from QI. And I think that whatever your expertise is, your vantage point's different. I do this exercise with like Venn diagrams. Is QI over, you know, is it QI I ask like this or is it like that, you know, and, and it really just depends on your vantage point. There are some key differences in the kind of methods and tools we use, but increasingly I'm seeing cross-pollination. And my guess is that in the next five years, it's just all kind of gonna be in the same toolkit and there won't be so much of a distinction. I mean, I think local QI is different, but improvement science looks more and more like IMSI and IMSI implementation science looks more and more like improvement science the way that I see it. And you talked a lot about how implementation science really is a team science. And you talked about the engagement of stakeholders and participatory research methods. You talked about multidisciplinary expertise. Um, when it comes to the, the, the success of an, uh, of an implementation science effort, um, and um, are there particular 
uh, supply shortages or groups of individuals, there's a deficit in training or in talent in any particular area where we're being held back from um, really more rapid growth in implementation science than we're already seeing. Um, is it in engineering? Is it in modeling? Is it in um, uh, behavioral economics? Is it, is it in cross-trained people like yourselves who are both content experts and methodologists? Can you speak a little bit to that, um, I guess on a national scale and then maybe specifically in your own work with your, your center at Penn? Yeah, I mean, team science is magic. And um, I am purposeful in um, amplifying the fact that this work is not done alone um, and that it requires the expertise of a number of different scientists and, and community partners and clinicians. I think one of the things we're facing broadly is a general um, massive demand for implementation science methods expertise. Um, and we don't quite have the supply nationally. So those implementation scientists that we have who are kind of disease agnostic, methods focused, are pulled in a lot of different directions. And even increasingly, there's a lot of folks reaching out who say, hey, I need an AIM-3, you know, like you might do for cost effectiveness. I want to add this implementation aim, but that's not really like the meat of it. And I just think that we don't, as a nation, have the workforce yet to supply all the different folks who want to incorporate this perspective into their work. And there's lots of efforts um, like the Training Institute in Cancer from the NCI and the Implementation Research Institute at Washington University in St. Louis, lots of different efforts to kind of get folks up to speed and the great work that ISKI is doing and training HIV and implementation science researchers nationally. But we still just don't have the numbers that we need. Um, and so our group gets over 10 inquiries a month um, with regard to wanting to add the implementation science expertise to teams. Um, and we just don't, we don't have the numbers to be able to meet that demand and to do exceptional science. So, um, you know, at Penn, we've started this implementation science institute that we have uh, annually. And this year we'll have 90 people attend. Um, and, you know, the demand is just so high for people to get training. So there's a couple of different opportunities nationally, but there's still, I think, a, an open space in terms of how to get this expertise and um, that has yet to be filled. Um, we only have a few minutes left, but there's a, there, one um, sort of recurring theme in the questions relates to the payer community. You, you talked a lot about um, resource uh, limits that uh, have uh, delayed or slowed the, uh, the take up of evidence-based practices uh, because of lack of infrastructure or, or workforce or uh, coverage for services delivered. Can you talk a bit about how your work or the work of implementation science either engages the payer or policy community or how you work to communicate effectively with them to advocate for changes? Yeah, absolutely. So almost all of our frameworks in implementation science have an uh, ecological lens. Um, and I would put the payer policymaker um, related matters in the kind of outer setting or the outer context, which is the broader sociopolitical context within which we work. Um, I've been really fortunate to work with a number of different payers and policymakers who really see the value of bringing an implementation science lens to ensure that the things that they're trying to do are actually informed um, by, uh, by what we know. Because, uh, you know, I think we often implement and then we don't learn and then nothing changes. And that's frustrating for people on the ground when every day there's a different flavor of the day. Um, and I think increasingly we're learning, we're moving towards these kind of learning health systems or learning mental health systems where there's measurement and iteration and continuous improvement. And I think that's really the future with measurement as the foundation. Um, and so I think it's a critical partner um, um, and uh, really important to do this work. And I also just think mental health care federally is not resourced enough. So no matter how innovative folks are, we just, we, as, an, as a country, have not resourced mental health in the way that it needs to be resourced. Well, Dr. Betis, this gives us a lot to think about. Um, thank you so much for sharing your work with us today and uh, your vision for implementation science over the next uh, decade in, in America. I think it's really inspiring to see what you've done and where the field is headed. Um, there are a few people that I do think want to contact with you. If you, if you can, uh, you know, um, show your contact information again oh, yeah. and with uh, how they can get in contact with you, that would be great. Um, but thank you so much. Yes, let me get this here. <laughs>
So please email me, tweet at me. Um, mm -hmm. I promise to respond and I'm really grateful for all the great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody.